Coming up on DTNS, the walls fall on music services and smart speakers, why China is pushing an official digital currency, and transparent OLED sliding doors that can say hi to you. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, December 7th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just talking about phones, both big old cell phones and our first cell phone numbers and all kinds of reminiscing. Uh, get that wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The latest Pixel feature drop adds adaptive sound to the Pixel 3 and newer devices, which improves speaker quality based on overall ambient sound. Pixels will also receive adaptive charging to better preserve your battery life. 5G-capable Pixels will get adaptive connectivity, which defaults to 4G for low bandwidth tests, also saves some of your battery life. The update also adds a number of features from the Pixel 5 to the older Pixel models, including extreme battery saver mode, hold for me, which uses Google Assistant to wait on a phone line until a human picks up. Airbnb, which is about to go public, launched Airbnb.org, a nonprofit that lets hosts offer free or discounted stays to refugees, people affected by natural disasters, and frontline workers. This builds off Airbnb's previous home, Open Homes and Frontline, which started back in 2012, to let hosts offer spaces for those impacted by Hurricane Sandy at the time. Hosts offering free stays will get a badge displayed on their Airbnb profile, and Airbnb.org will partner with relief organizations like the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies and Community Organized Relief Efforts. The Wall Street Journal sources also say that Airbnb boosted its IPO price range to between $56 and $60, from $44 to $50, which values the company up to $42 billion. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are still out there going, wait, wasn't the U.S. going to ban TikTok or something? Well, uh, ByteDance did have most recently until December 4th to reach a deal to spin off its U.S. operations. No deal has been finalized. However, Bloomberg sources say the U.S. Treasury Department told ByteDance it would not face a fine or any other penalty since negotiations are still ongoing. A Treasury spokesperson said the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. and ByteDance are working to finalize a divestment that would satisfy U.S. security concerns, and no new deadline has been announced. A new patent shows that Oppo is working on a detachable camera module for smartphones. The patent shows the camera module with an included battery, as well as USB-C, NFC, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth capability. The camera also includes a USB-C connection, which could be mounted to the phone as well. The patent shows two camera lenses in the module and opens up the possibility to potentially upgrade the camera separately from the overall device. Ah, the long-standing dream of essential phones and Motorola phones and even going back to the uh, Palm Trio, I think, had tried this kind of thing. We'll see if it works. Uh, the UK's first electric vehicle service station opened near Braintree, Essex. The electric forecourt from GridServe offers 36 rapid chargers with electricity coming from solar power canopies above the chargers, as well as GridServe's network of hybrid solar farms. The station also includes other service station staples like a coffee shop, newsstand, a post office, as well as a meeting room, pods, and a fitness area with bikes that generate electricity for your car. All right, let's talk a little bit more about peace in our time. Uh, oh, more music services. We're getting closer to it anyway. Google announced that Apple Music is now available on Google Assisted Enabled Smart Speakers and Displays in the U.S., the U.K., France, Germany, and Japan. So you can set Apple Music as the default music service and then control the app by voice, just like with YouTube Music, Spotify, and Pandora, which were all previously uh uh, on Google Assisted Smart Speakers as well. You can also play Apple Music on multiple speakers if you want whole home audio, if you've got a few speakers. Tidal and Amazon Music, though, are the only major music services that Google Assistant has yet to support. Ah, two more to go. Uh, that would be big. I, it was pretty big when Apple showed up on Amazon Echoes uh, oh, back yeah. in 2018. And that kind of signaled that, that we were headed this way. It took Google a couple of years to, to reach an agreement, but it seems like they have. And, and I like this idea that I eventually someday can just pick my music service and my smart speaker and not worry about whether the two play along nicely with each other. 
You know, Google Assistant is one of my favorites on mobile. Uh, I just feel like it works better than Siri, uh, at least for the queries that I'm asking for. There are a lot of things about Google Assistant that I like a lot. I do not have any physical Google speakers or other smart devices. I do have Echoes. Uh, they're, they're Sonos speakers, but they work with Amazon's Assistant. And I am an Apple Music user. And so when that all came into play together, it was like, ah, chef's kiss. So yeah, I think that if Google or any other company is having some traction with hardware, wants to sell more units, it just behooves all companies to offer as many services as possible. It would be kind of like Google saying, well, you can't access Apple Music in Chrome. I mean, the company just wouldn't do that. So this is just an extension of that. Yeah, for the longest time, I was Google Play Music uh, since, uh, oh, going back to RDO, when RDO went, went away. Oh, RIP uh, RDO. I know. I love that service. Uh, so so Google Play Music and Google Home, Google Assistant worked great for me. I was, I was very happy with that integration. Uh, but when Apple Music came to the Amazon Echo, I went ahead and added my subscription to my wife's because she had Apple Music and that way we had a family plan and that let me play music on the Echo because there was no integration with YouTube Music and there still is not. Uh, and that kind of started to nudge me into using Apple Music more. Then they switched Google Play Music to YouTube Music and that kind of pushed me all the way back into Apple Music. So it's ironic that now I'm like, oh, I could go back to using Google Assistant for music stuff more often because I actually... I'm able to use Apple Music on the Google speakers, but that's the way it should work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know a few Title users, and I'm not trying to make a joke about it. I I know Title has uh, a certain kind of audio quality um, that some people are willing to Ter pay for. I know Terrence Gaines, and and I think Nika too, but I know for sure Terrence uh, from SnobOS uses it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, audio files swear by Title uh, because again, quality. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see. The Amazon Google thing makes sense to me. You know, they're gonna duke it out for a little while. But uh, but yeah, how long until both companies say, let's just work together, we're just all gonna benefit. Yeah. yeah. Well, LG announced a reorganization of its mobile phone business to outsource uh, more phones, this time mid-end smartphones, to ODMs, original design manufacturers. It'll still carry the LG branding, it's just uh, won't be made by LG. This is similar to what Nokia and BlackBerry do, where another company doesn't just build them. I mean, Foxconn builds Apple phones, right? But Apple designs them. LG won't even design these. Another company will design. That's why it's ODM, original design manufacturer, uh, and then sell the phones under the licensed brand name. So all Nokia and Blackberries are made by other companies and sold under their names. Uh, the lower end LG phones were already being made by other companies. Now the mid-range Ones will also be made by other companies as well, still sold under the LG name. LG will reduce its research and production positions and focus its R&D on premium smartphones, cutting costs on the production of these mid-range phones. So really trying to shave off their losses because LG has had 22 consecutive quarters of losses in its mobile communications business. Uh, I don't know that the LG high-end phones are going to last much longer, honestly, given that they're they're now down to like number seven in market share. Uh, and I think 2013 was the last time they were in the top five. Yeah. I, the idea of cutting costs and letting other companies essentially make your, your mid-range and lower-end phones, slap the LG name on it at the end, uh, that, that makes perfect sense. So LG saying, okay, well, our flagship phones... We're still going to handle that ourselves. Best of luck. Maybe maybe they will have some luck with this. But with that many consecutive quarters of losses, almost two, well, gosh, I mean, <laughs> math is hard, but 22 consecutive quarters of losses is many years of losses. Uh, it, Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if LG just gets out of the uh, design manufacturing business uh, totally at some point. And, and keep in mind, there's there's a couple of different LGs. There's LG Display and LG Electronics. Uh, they they have some some connection at the very very top end of the corporate structure, but they're they're essentially two different business. LG Electronics is the one that does TVs, uh, home appliances, kitchen, you know, refrigerators, laundry, etc. They're doing great with their white goods like like washers and dryers and and refrigerators. They're doing mm -hmm. great with TVs. Uh, they are obviously not doing so well with phones, but phones used to be the bedrock of LG Electronics. So 
I do feel like they this is this is a big deal. And and yeah, they're gonna make more money licensing out the name than making these low end phones, but not as much money as if they had successful phones. Yeah. Well, speaking of successes, the M1 isn't the last chip designed from Apple. It has uh, been uh, available on, on certain computers to do quite a bit of fanfare. And it seems obvious, but some folks seemed also skeptical of how well that M1 chip would be at powering bigger Macs. So sure, MacBook Air, Mac Mini, great. What about the others? The answer is there are other chips for that. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman and Ian King's sources say that Apple plans to release the new Apple Silicon chip, also known as whatever version of the M1 they call it, as early as the spring for larger MacBook Pros and also the iMac, reportedly featuring up to 16 high-performance cores and four efficiency cores, although high-performance cores could be limited to 8 or 12 depending on production. Apple's also testing 16 and 24 core GPUs for these same chips. Another chip with as many as 32 high performance cores and up to 128 graphics cores is reportedly planned to arrive in late 2021 to eventually show up in a half sized Mac Pro, reportedly scheduled for release in 2022. Yeah. So, I mean, they might be called the M2 and the M3. They might not. We don't know, but <laughs> we're, we're definitely getting a couple more chips. And that shouldn't be a shock, but. When everyone was looking at like, yeah, but you can only get 16 gig of RAM, part of the answer was these chips are so efficient, you probably don't need a lot more RAM, right. uh, especially because it's all integrated on the die. But the other answer was these are the lower power chips. I'm sure they'll have support for more USB-C Thunderbolt ports for more amounts of RAM integrated, still probably integrated, but, but more RAM in higher power chips. And that's what this points to, is you're going to have beefy chips i mean 32 high performance cores in a uh intriguingly referenced as half size mac pro uh, i know yeah, yeah. I, I can't wait to see that i can't wait to see what the prices will be as well because boy does it look good on paper but uh these would re you know if uh well i don't know i mean maybe the m1 chip uh versions of of some of the machines that we're getting right now. And I've got a MacBook Air, one of the new ones that that is is powered by an M1 chip. I I mean, they're priced competitively for Apple products. Yeah. Not necessarily competitive for, you know, the entire market. Depends right. on what you want. But there's but, not a change, right? They're yeah, about there wasn't the same some as astronomical. The, as the yeah, yeah. Like if you want better performance, then you know, you're gonna have to pay double. Mac Pros totally priced out of most people's um wheelhouse but who knows yeah they're meant they're meant for the professional market i, I would yeah. i would guess based on what we saw this with the introduction of the m1 that they'll the prices will stay around the same uh that the well, put it this way the price change won't be dependent on these chips uh if well, they change the prices it'll be for some other reason and i think that's part of the reason that so many folks myself included cuz i've been i've been using my new macbook air i'm not using it right now cuz i have a mac mini for the my show setup but it's been my kind of just puttering around computer for all lots of other things um you know for for a couple weeks now and i think that one of the things is wow this thing is fast but also and it's also priced in the same vein as what you would expect to pay for an Apple product. And so that's like, you know, if it was twice as much, people would say, yeah, it's pretty fast, but like price has got to come down or no one's going to buy these. And I think that's, that's where a lot of enthusiasm comes from. Yes, it's performance, but it's also the fact that the price isn't astronomical. Yeah. And, and there've been some questions about whether the M1 performance seems so good because it was on these smaller machines, but it sounds like they're going to have beefier Apple Silicon for the bigger machines. Uh, you you have you have been trying out that MacBook Air. I mean, all we have to go on at this point is the M1. Yeah, it sounds sounds like you're pretty pleased with it. Very pleased. There were a couple of things that I did when I got the machine. I you know I, I brought over just the sort of bare minimum of stuff that I was going to dump onto the hard drive itself, even though there's two terabytes and I've never had a machine with that much storage before. But you know I I uh, I'm using Chrome and and Safari as my second and third browsers because you always have to I don't know we need multiple browsers to like test stuff but I'm using Firefox as my as my kind of number one uh, which I haven't done in years so there's a few things I'm doing to sort of be like okay let's pep this up a tiny bit but 
the uh, the air is also unique in that there's no fan. So there's no fan noise. And when I have done a lot of sort of complicated labor intensive rendering of video or that sort of thing, you know, you hear it kind of start up and you go, okay, now we're, now we're cooking with gas. And this little thing just sits there silently. And sometimes I'm like, are you alive? <laughs> You're working so well. Are you okay? You need food. Like in, and uh, battery life is really good. Again, new machine. I will say, I mean, tiny gripe, but I had four Thunderbolt ports on my MacBook Pro, which still exists. It's fine. It's just, you know, it, I, it's sort of over to the side right now. I've just got the two on the new Air, and they're on the both on the left side. And just where I plug it in, I wish they were on the right-hand side. And I can see where, you know, if I was plugging in a bunch of, you know, peripherals or whatever, that's going to be slightly a little bit of an issue. But I'll say overall, the speediness, the zippiness, and just Mac... Um, Mac apps themselves clearly, but just in general is remarkably faster. Just remarkably faster. I I I can't say it any other way. It's yeah, uh, I, I've been pleasantly be the universal surprised. Universal sentiment, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah, it's crazy. Uh, well, folks, if you got some thoughts on uh, Apple Silicon or anything else, join in the conversation in our Discord. You can do that by linking to a Patreon account at Patreon.com/slash/DTNS. Saturday, uh, China's big shopping giant, JD.com, became the first virtual platform to accept digital yuan, uh, the government's official digital currency. The People's Bank of China will issue about 20 million yuan in digital red envelopes to 100,000 residents of the city of Suzhou, uh, which is near Beijing, who can, or near Shanghai, actually, who can use it on JD digits to pay for some products at JD's online mall. Uh, so they're giving grants of this to people so they'll try it out and they can use it online. Now, the bank previously issued 10 million digital yuan to 50,000 residents of Shenzhen for use at physical retail locations. So it's not the launch of the digital currency, but it is the launch of the first place to be able to use it online. As of early November, digital yuan had been used in more than 4 million transactions worth about the equivalent of $306 million U.S. Okay, so... I had a lot of questions about this story because I I know it's a big story and I think a lot of folks out there, if you're anything like me, are like, okay, well, we know that China is a digital currency friendly country already. You know, just think of WeChat or digital payment friendly. Digital payment friendly. Yeah. Right. But it's not as if, you know, everyone's, you know, uh, you know, got a bunch of cash in their pocket. So you go, okay, digital currency is still based on the yuan. So how does this actually change life for folks inside of China unless it's folks who say, I don't know, I just don't trust banks and I want another option? Yeah, if if, if there's anybody out there uh, in China, we're, we're banned, so probably not listening uh, in China. But uh, if there's anybody that knows, email us, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. I do think the idea is... It's so easy to pay with WeChat Pay or Alipay, and you scan your QR code, and that's how people send money to each other, that what the government wants to do is encourage usage of the digital yawn to make the back end easier. So for the consumer, yeah, I mean, this isn't, from what I can see, any easier than paying with Alipay uh, at the counter or online, but they're giving these grants to kind of get people to use it, to get people in the habit of knowing about it, and to try out the system. They're going to try out the system on JD.com so that you can show the businesses and the banks how much if more efficient it is on the back end. Because remember, with Alipay and WeChat Pay, it still has to be turned into hard currency at some point, right? right, you, right. There's there's these online accounts, but some bank somewhere else has to has to reconcile all of that with actual paper money uh, or coins or whatever, probably mostly paper money. Uh, with digital yawn, you don't have to do that. So it cuts out a whole lot of the infrastructure of settling payments and having to do transactions and it speeds them up on the back end. So I, I don't know that it really has a whole lot of advantages for the customer other than, oh, I'm using the official currency. I'm not, I'm not, maybe I have to pay fewer fees because it's cheaper to run on the back end. And of course, it also has the big advantage of the government knowing exactly what's going on with it because they control the system that the digital yuan runs on. So that was going to be my next question. Okay, let's say here I am in the U.S. and I want to participate. 
And now the Chinese government maybe has a little bit more information about the transactions that I'm making. And it's not tied to the U.S. dollar and all sorts of things that well, it's many not people. Meant for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's only meant for. Domestic well, OK, so, so maybe that was a bad example. But, you know, someone in a, a variety of other countries that, you know, are, are on friendly terms with the Chinese government. Well, No, uh, I just mean it's meant for domestic use. They really don't mean this at this point to be used for overseas. I guess if you're traveling there, you could pick up some digital yuan, but yeah. it seems like it might be early days for that. Well, speaking of early days, if you didn't find the launch and rollout of HBO Max confusing, well, <laughs> Warner Media might give you another chance to be confused. <laughs> the information sources say that the company is considering launching two new streaming services. One could be a paid CNN service, that would offer more deep dive originals and international content. The other being a free ad supported channel with content from TNT and TBS. Sources say that neither service is green lit yet. They're just on the table, but the CNN service could potentially launch in 2021 with the other not launching until 2022 at the earliest. So, okay. Uh, the CNN one makes sense. That is a niche market. Uh, that is something that, Somebody who they might get through HBO Max, they might get to pay a few extra dollars for a specialty documentary service is essentially what this sounds like to me, mm -hmm. right? CNN does those, you know, living in the 80s or specials about Africa. You know, they, they have these kind of evergreen programs that aren't tied to the daily headlines. Uh, and I, I could see that being something that somebody would be like, oh, I really love those shows. You know, I'll pay a few extra dollars to add that to my subscription service. The TNT TBS one, it's free ad supported. Uh, so I guess that sort of makes sense, but they've said they want to do a free ad supported HBO Max as well. So I'm not sure why you would do something that would have some of the TNT and TBS stuff is showing up on HBO Max as well, unless they're changing their strategy. Or I guess, you know what? I'm just thinking this as I'm saying it out loud. This could be their Pluto or their Zumo, or even uh, Tubi or Fubo. I know the names, if you're not familiar with them, <laughs> sounds ridiculous. But there are free ad-supported streaming services out there that are getting a lot of take up. And maybe this is their attempt to do that, right? Because Pluto is owned by uh, Viacom CBS. Zumo is owned by Comcast. Uh, I think uh, Tubi is owned by Fox. So they all have these free versions of services out there. And maybe that's what HBO Max is thinking is we'll take some of our comedy entertainment stuff from TNT, TBS, et cetera, and put it on a free streaming service. Cause they, all the companies do seem to be creating the, these tiers of, we have our, our free service. We have our mainstream service, like a Peacock or a CBS all access. And then we have a premium service like a Showtime. Yeah. I think what tripped me up at first is uh, looking at the paid CNN service, rumored service, I was like, paid CNN? You know, I'm already paying AT&T Watch Now. Gosh, is that even what it's called? AT&T yeah. TV Now, yeah. TV Now, yeah. I mean, <laughs> forgive me. There are many options. <laughs> but uh, I was like, paid, eh, that's already part of my bundle. Like, what? what is this about? I think that, that they'll, they're going to have to rename that whole thing because people go like, that's what, what would I pay more for that? It could be, yeah, that longer form docu-series stuff, which CNN and, and other networks do quite well. And that is something that might be premium enough that uh, you might uh, fling a couple bucks a month at. Um, when it comes to, yeah, TNT and TBS and this free ad-supported channel, even if there's some overlap with HBO Max now, what do they have to lose? It's free ad support. Yeah, if it's free, you know? and they can yeah, just like build see up what sticks. And... Experimental could exactly. be a gateway to get people into HBO Max, I suppose. That too. Although if they do a free ad supported version of HBO Max, which they've said they wanted to, I don't know why you would also need this. So maybe, but maybe they're changing their mind on that. I don't know. Uh, what I would, I, I already see the people in the chat room like, ah, oh, why too many streaming services? I can't subscribe to them all. We just have to get used to the idea that this isn't cable television anymore. You don't have to subscribe to them all. This is <laughs> an open That's marketplace. Right. Just like you wouldn't have, you don't have to buy every book that comes out in the bookstore, uh, you don't have to buy every streaming service uh, that comes out. You pick the ones that you want to watch, that that have stuff that, that you want to watch. And and you will end up, if you only pick the stuff you actually have time to watch, you'll probably end up spending less than you would have to cable. I know. It's it's funny sort of unraveling this idea of like, wait a second, a hundred bucks a month used to get me everything, but I only liked one third of those things. 
well, now you can pay, pay for, for one, one third, third of those things and probably <laughs> save a few bucks a month. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Speaking of the future, LG partnered with the Swedish company Asa Abloy Entrance Systems to develop automatic sliding doors using its transparent OLED displays. LG says that the displays can be used by businesses to greet customers, communicate with employees, and show ads. No word on whether this, uh, when this tech will be available to businesses. Just an idea for now, but they're obviously working on it. LG transparent OLEDs are already used in windows on some Chinese subway cars, so it is already technology in use. Yeah, this is a, this is a really interesting story. Uh, I, I should disclose up top, I own nine shares in Asa Abloy that I never expected to be a conflict on this show because they're like a, they're a, they make doors for, for, for like retail establishments. But here we are, this is the world we live in. Uh, I have to disclose that now because LG wants to send, sell some OLED screens to them. And this is, this is cool sounding technology where I think what we're gonna experience is you'll look at a door, you'll think it's a decal. We're all used to seeing see-through decals on a store. And then it'll change and you'll realize, oh, that's not a decal, that's a live display. And uh, even more creepy would be if it actually senses you <laughs> and is like, hi, Sarah, 20% uh, off today. Just tell oh, me yeah. here. No, I think that's definitely the idea. In a retail setting, imagine, you know, you're in a store, you're kind of like, ah, I'm done. I didn't feel like buying anything. And, you know, much as you get the emails from companies being like, hey, there's still something in your cart. You know, the store is like, we noticed that you touched those socks over in that bin. Yeah. Would it's you 50% like percent off? Yeah. Before yeah. you leave, you know, maybe, you know, we can, you know, do us a solid, uh, that kind of thing. I also think, and I know this is, you know, there's a lot of retail um, reasons that this would come in handy, certainly ads or, you know, incentives or, or that sort of thing. But imagine you've got a sliding glass door in your house and you look out onto a parking lot depending on where you live, right? And to be able to have something that in the future looks like the beach or palm trees or the mountains or a stream or whatever you want. This actually has some like pretty cool implications just in general as far as uh, where you are, what kind of light you want shining into your house and, uh, and, and then, you know, the retail stuff as well. Yeah, I, and apparently uh, they're already using these OLED displays on subway cars in China. Mm. Uh, so that you're looking out at the landscape as you you tool around in the subway car, uh, you know, because sometimes they're not subs, sometimes they go above ground, and then suddenly you see you see an ad for, yeah. for the mountain for is like delicious coconut water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if you have thoughts on anything we talked about in this show or past shows or future shows, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send those emails. We want to shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include David Mosher, Reed Fischler, and Mark Gibson. Oh, folks, the holidays are coming. We got all kinds of specials. In the offing is our seventh year anniversary of Daily Tech News Show, and we have new merch offerings for folks that continue all year long. The old merch offerings on Patreon ended every three months, but the new ones continue all year long. More to come on that. But in the meantime, we want to send you a holiday card. If you're a patron and you have given us your address by December 10th, we will send you a hippopotamus-themed holiday card with art from Len Peralta. Uh, you can check if we've got your address by going to patreon.com slash pledges, find DTNS, look in the right-hand column, and if it's there, make sure it's correct. If it's not, you can add it. If you don't want to add it, that's fine. I'm just not going to send you a card if I don't know where to send it. So if you want that holiday card, become a Patreon now. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash Patreon. If you can join us live, we'd love to have you Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more at DailyTechNewsShow.com slash live. We will be back tomorrow with Patrick Norton, AVXL. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>